What is the rise after the fall? Leaders fall, leaders fail. It's unfortunate, but it is inevitable. What do we do when that happens? What do we do when that leader isn't us? And what do we do when that leader is us? My pastor, Fulton Buntain, had a great line. He said, failure is never final. Have you made it final in your life? I hope you haven't. Because there is a rise after the fall. Hi. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. I love your pastor. I met Pastor Sean 10 years ago. And I remember the first time I met him, I was like, I love this guy. I like this guy. He's a little crazy. <laughs> but crazy is good. How many are crazy here this morning? Yeah. Anybody ready to dive into God's word? Yes. All right. Well, that's three of you. All right. The rest of you need to get saved. All right. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be in your word today and to hear from you. We ask that this would be an incredible moment. Just Take us away, Lord. We want to be with you for these next 30 minutes. We want to hear from your heart to ours. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 Buddy and Edna went to the state fair here in Green Bay. And every year, Buddy would say, Edna, I want to ride that helicopter. Edna would say, I know, Buddy, but that hel helicopter ride is 50 bucks, and 50 bucks is 50 bucks. Well, the next year, they went to the state fair. Buddy said, Edna, I am now 83 years old. How long are we going to wait to ride the helicopter ride? I might not ever get the chance. And Edna said, buddy, that helicopter ride is 50 bucks, and 50 bucks is 50 bucks. The pilot is standing there. He overhears this. He remembers them from the previous year. He goes, hey, excuse me, folks. I can't, couldn't help but hear you. Tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll take you both up for free. The deal is you can't make a single noise during the entire helicopter ride. If I land and you haven't made a peep, you get it for free. Is it a deal? They're like, yeah. So Buddy and Ed to go up in the helicopter. The pilot does all kinds of fancy maneuvers. He's diving. He's turning. Oh, my goodness. He just took them on a roller coaster ride. Finally, he lands the helicopter, and he turns to Buddy, and he said, Man, I did everything I could to get you to yell out, but I didn't hear a peep. I am impressed. And Buddy said, well, to tell you the truth, I almost said something would end to fell out, but 50 <laughs> bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> How many agree? 50 bucks is 50 bucks, yeah. Before Sandy and I were married, uh, I actually prayed that I would marry a California blonde. So I want to tell you, prayer works. True story. I went to California on vacation. I was a young man, 21 years old, and I saw these cute California blondes, and I was like, I would pray at night. Now I lay me down to sleep, and Lord, please help me find a California blonde. Amen. <laughs> and God answered my prayer. So I want to just uh, point out my wife, Sandy. She saw it. Would you stand for just a second, hon? There's my California blonde. She's so cute. Has anybody ever made a bad decision? Wow, look at you all holy and everything. Anybody ever made a bad decision? Yeah. Mm-hmm. One time Sandy and I wanted to get out of town and we didn't have much money. Our kids were like seven and eight years old. And so I booked a cheap hotel up in the mountains to get out of the Phoenix heat. And we get to this hotel, and Sandy just groans. I mean, the carpet is threadbare. The bathroom was so dinky. When you close the door, you got goosed by the doorknob. And the bath mat outside the shower was a paper bath mat. How many know it's a hoopty motel when you got a paper bath mat? And I'm thinking, how do I recover from this bad decision? And right about then, I could hear our kids giggling. <laughs> I go back in where the beds are, and they had a coin-operated vibrator in each bed. How many remember those? And so, <laughs> my daughter turns to me, she's like, Daddy, put a quarter in, you know? So I put a quarter in in both beds, and Josh and Chrissy, our kids, they're just laying there, and, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. and Chrissy turns to my son and says, Josh, isn't this the best hotel ever? I'm like, yes, <laughs> Daddy victory, right? Isn't it fun how sometimes a bad decision can turn into something beautiful? So good. A bad decision. That's God's specialty. 
giving us beauty for ashes. I have a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Colorado. The longer I talk, the more you'll wonder how I ever got it. I wasn't always a pastor. I was an engineering manager for Honeywell in Phoenix and in Colorado Springs. And then Sandy and I moved to the Seattle area because I got a job working for Microsoft. And this is when in the 90s when Microsoft was a smaller company. I was the director for worldwide operations. It was my dream job at my dream company. And I was going to be one of the Microsoft millionaires of the 90s. I was making a six-figure salary. I had 16,000 shares of Microsoft stock. I had a spreadsheet on my screensaver on my computer that would calculate my net worth every morning. I would come in and turn it on, and up would pop this screen, and I'd be like, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> it was, uh, sh stock was selling for like $250, $300 a share then. I got two cash bonuses of $25,000, and one of them was like at the beginning of November. I would just give it to Sandy and say, have a good time for Christmas shopping. How many would like to experience that? Wouldn't that be cool? And that's when God called me into the ministry. Not cool. <laughs> this pastor calls me and he says, would you like to plant a church in a place called Surprise? I'm like, no, you can tell me what the name of it is. He's like, no, it's called Surprise, Arizona. And he says, hey, why don't we meet for breakfast at Denny's? I don't eat at Denny's. I do now, but I didn't eat it at Denny's back then. So I agreed. I said, hey, so I rent my standard rental Cadillac that I would get as I travel for Microsoft, and I drive up to this Denny's, and here comes this pastor driving up in his old Ford pickup truck, and I'm like, huh, doesn't look like he makes much money. And so he starts talking about there's no church, there's no building, there's no people, there's nothing. You just kind of, you know, parachute in, and you start a church. I'm like, well, can you tell me what the compensation package is? <laughs> and he goes, 22000 a year. I go, in my mind, I go, I paid double that in income tax last year. Are you kidding me? And I felt something. So I had to give up what we had. Because, see, at Microsoft, if you quit, you lose your stock options. They're called golden handcuffs. They're designed to keep you there. I was a millionaire on paper, but I lost it all. So we moved to Surprise, Arizona, bought a house. I actually bought it while I was still working at Microsoft as a second house because I could qualify then. And we started having a core group meeting in our living room. According to Outreach Magazine, our church, Radiant Church in Surprise, Arizona, grew from zero to 6,200 people in 10 years. 6,000 people. If I have to confess, I'm a workaholic. Any of you workaholics? Yeah. <laughs> you can't even raise your head. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like to work, but it's a curse. It can, you gotta be careful with that. So I was drinking three Rockstar Energy drinks per day, the tall ones, Rockstar Lemonade, that's the drink of choice. On Sundays, I would drink five because we had three services. We had one Friday service, two Saturday services, three Sunday services. I got very exhausted, very burned out in a very unhealthy place. So 10 years ago, July 17th, 2011, I had to stand up in front of my church and tell the and confess to them that I had a moral failure. I'm a fallen pastor of a megachurch. I didn't set out to have a moral failure. Nobody ever says, let's see if I can screw up everything about my life. But that's what it did. It started on Facebook, pretty innocent. I love staying in touch with people. The more you're around me, you realize I'm a, my, I'm a people person. I, I'm the last to leave church. Sandy's like, just because you're the pastor doesn't mean you have to be the last one to leave. And I go, but there might be somebody who wants to talk to me. <laughs> and Sandy's an introvert, so that's really fun. You know, she's like, can we go home now? But she would love to say hi to you today, just so you're wondering. <laughs> but it's easy to let your guard down. 
Next thing you know, somebody sent in you a DM, hey, I really like that shirt you had on today. Oh. They're not talking about the shirt sometimes. Next thing you know, you're sending DMs, and then it turns to text messages of things you should not be saying to somebody else. And then it gets worse. Somebody shows up in your office. Suddenly it isn't just electronic, it's reality, it's physical. A three second grope happened in my office, brief physical contact. I thank God it did not turn into a full blown affair, but in the ministry world, you're out. That three-second physical contact devastated my life. It wiped out my family's life. It ruined my ministry. I had to quit as the pastor of the church we started and poured our life into. 22-acre campus, 120,000 square feet under roof. I lost everything. But... I was wrong. I sinned. How dare I do that? I sinned against God first, my wife second, and my kids. Nobody else is to blame. I let many people down. Now, my wife Sandy is amazing. You may not even want to talk to me after this, but you'll probably want to talk to her. She's the hero of my story. She was mad at me for like five minutes. I said, do you want me to go get a hotel? She goes, no. Do you want me to sleep in the guest room? <laughs> no. She goes, you're... You're my husband. I don't want you to think for one second that I stopped loving you. We'll get through this like we've got through everything else. She chose to show me grace and love. She never said the word divorce. Murder, yes. Divorce, no. <laughs> Sandy and I have been married 41 years now. Uh, <laughs> Give Sandy a hand. We got married when we were 10, in case you're doing the math. <laughs> my son Josh is 30, and my daughter Chrissy is 29. They're both married. But our kids paid an awesome, terrible price for my sin. I lost my ministry, my truck, my job, my income, my health plan, our house. I'm like a country song. <laughs> I lost all those things. <laughs> On top of that, then we had a lawsuit filed against us for millions of dollars, and that led to a whole bunch of junk on the Internet, people talking about stuff they don't know what they're talking about. And the lawsuit's over now, but there's things on the Internet that never leave the Internet. We have Al Gore to blame for that since he's the one who actually invented the Internet. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> there's a bunch of slanderous lies out there, and... I've always said I'm not going to defend myself. Let God take care of that. Do you know if you let God defend you, he does a lot better job than you can do. Yeah. So I went through a two-year restoration program with Pastor Tommy Bardet at Dream City Church in Phoenix. He's, he's like Yoda to all us pastors, you know. He's like, you, restore. Yes, we will. <laughs> and uh, I had to pay for my own weekly counseling for two years. Hardest thing I've ever gone through. Now, some of you might be like, wow, why did Sean and Sonny decide to have you speak? <laughs> what a depressing story. All right, listen, stay with me now. We're going to climb back out of this. I promise this will be encouraging. Like Liz Taylor said to her seven husbands, I won't keep you long. So let's jump in. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do when you sinned against a holy God? 
That's what I love about the Bible. It has the answer. Look at 1 Peter 5, verse 10. In fact, I would love for us to read this out loud. It's up on the screen. Would you read it with me nice and loud? And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has you to the eternal glory of Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Do you know who restores you? God does. So what is my part? If you're taking notes, you might want to fill this in. Number one, let Jesus restore me. You have to let Jesus restore you. That starts by saying, I'm wrong, I'm broken, Lord, would you fix me? You have to let him in. Now, most people, even if they're not Christians, know the story of Peter denying Jesus three times in Matthew 26. Peter denied Jesus before the what crowed? The rooster crowed, yeah. The Bible tells us in Matthew 26, verse 72, Peter is uh, warming himself by a fire of coals. Matthew 26, verse 72, it says, he, somebody comes up to Peter and they go, hey, you were with that Jesus guy, weren't you? Here's what happens. He denied it again. He's already denied it once. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. A little while later, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Peter, he had seen Jesus walk on water. He'd seen Jesus feed 5,000 people. And now when the chips are down, he says, I don't even know him. Peter, how could you do such a thing? Jesus even said on you, I will build my church. See, Peter's problems didn't start that night. They never do. All of us, the struggles we have, they don't happen overnight, do they? A really bad decision starts with a thousand little bad decisions leading up to it. If we're honest, we know we all have issues that have been building for a long time. Peter was the same way. Peter was a liar. Peter was two-faced. Peter had a temper. Now, some of you might be thinking, yes, Pastor Lee, but Pastor Sean always tells us, the Bible tells us Jesus accepts me just the way I am, warts and all. Yes, Pastor Sean is right. Pastor Sonny is right. Jesus accepts you where you are, but he is not content to leave you there. He wants you to deal with your issues. How many of you have issues? Raise your hand. All right, those of you who did not raise your hand, your issue is lying. <laughs> And pride, we actually all have issues, don't we? We're all a mess. Turn to the person next to you right now and say, you are a hot mess. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> hot mess. Hey, don't get into detail. Just you are a hot mess. Leave it there, okay? <laughs> yep. But God always gives you another chance. That's what this series is about. The whole idea of this series that Pastor Sean and Pastor Sonny are doing, the rise after the fall. God always gives you another chance. How many are excited about that? Give the Lord a big hand today. God always gives you another chance. But there's an attitude that's required or it won't work. Number two, stay humble or I stumble. Peter has denied that he knows Jesus three times. And then the Bible says he caught Jesus looking at him. Can you imagine if your best friend in the whole wide world that you'd lived life with, you'd ate with, you'd done miracles with, all these wonderful things, and you have just said, I tell you, and you curse, and then you say, I don't know the man, and right about then, he is off in a distance being beat up and tried for something he didn't do, and he looks at you. And verse 72 says, he went outside and wept bitterly. You know what I've found in the last 10 years? There are blessings in being broken and humble. God does his best work then. Psalm 34 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. There's something beautiful that happens when you are broken. That's when Jesus walks up 
and he puts a robe on you. The Bible says he clothes us in righteousness, a righteous robe. Whenever Sandy hears a noise outside at night, I put this sucker on and the thieves run. <laughs> <laughs> a robe of righteousness. This is based on Isaiah 61 verse 10 in the Old Testament. It says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of whose? Whose? His righteousness. See, when you say, Jesus, I am brokenhearted over my sin, he comes and he goes, here, put on my righteousness, and it'll cover that. Isn't that beautiful? But we have to stay broken. See, I think sometimes we think our sin is not as bad as somebody else's sin. We look at somebody else and go, well, at least I didn't do that. Some of your husbands will be driving home with their wife from church today, and you'll be like, at least I didn't do that. <laughs> Give me some credit, baby. <laughs> we think God is lucky to have us on his team. We start thinking our sin isn't really a big deal. And the Bible says, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. Yeah. The Bible says our righteousness, what we can pull out, that is like a filthy rag to God. Our good works never save us. We need the righteousness of Jesus to cover us up. Then God sees you as a son or daughter of the king. Purple robe, that stands for royalty. You are a son of the king. You are a daughter of the king. How many are glad about that today? You are adopted by the king. Your sins then are separate. Oh, I love this so much. Thank you, Jesus. Your sins are separated from you as far as the east is from the west. How many are glad about that? The Bible says God takes our sins and throws them into the depths of the ocean. How many are really glad about that? You are forgiven. And now when you die, you're going to heaven, a perfect place with no more tears, no more pain, no more cancer. So all you have to do is say, Jesus, I accept. I'm in. I need the robe. See, if you've never asked Jesus to forgive you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that when we close in a little bit. Or maybe you've drifted. You're a Christian. You already took that step. This has to come off. It's really hot. <laughs> and if you drifted, lady, lady, lately, it's a good time to recommit to talk to God about what's going on. Because if you have failed like I have, please, number three, refuse to lose the dream. Go back to John now, the Gospel of John. John 21, it tells us about a decision that Peter makes. He says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. Peter is like, all right, I've failed at this whole ministry thing with Jesus. Obviously, I'm done. I'm going back to fishing. Here's what I've discovered. You can't look back. How many agree? If you start staring behind you, you will crash. Have you ever noticed in your car, the rearview mirror is small. The windshield is big. You know why? If you stare at that rearview mirror, you're going to crash. You're going to look forward. How many are going to ready to look forward? If we fail, here's what happens. We want to give up. We want to just walk away. But Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, the gifts and calling of the Lord are irrevocable. Yes. Now, I realize some of you might be sitting here going, whatever, bro. I don't agree with the pastor coming back after he's done something like that. I can appreciate that. But perhaps you're contradicting a major strategy that God uses. God uses people who have failed. <laughs> it's all throughout the Bible. Next time you think God can't use you anymore, just remember this. Noah was a drunk 
In fact, Noah was a naked drunk. Genesis chapter 9. You know you've got a problem if every time you get drunk, somehow you end up naked as well. How many agree? That's a drunk drunk. <laughs> Abraham was old. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. I mean, Joseph was a daydreamer. Moses stuttered. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was always crying. David had an affair. And then he murdered the husband. David. God goes, there's a man after my own heart. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job fought for bankruptcy. John the Baptist ate locusts. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced. Zacchaeus was too short. Paul was too religious. Timothy was too young. Pastor Sean's a little crazy, but God uses them all, and he can use you too. Give the Lord a big hand. God can use you. So what's the answer? Number four, listen for God's voice. The boys are back to their old occupation. John 21 verse 3 gives us the deal. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? And the answer back to Jesus, what? Say it with me now. Say it with some attitude. Oh, no, you've been fishing all night, and you haven't caught nothing, and some smarty pants landlubber is standing on the shore going, did you caught any fish? What would you answer back to him? No. No, with a little more gusto. No. Jerk. (laughs) Why do you want to listen for Jesus calling out? Number five, trust Jesus to turn failures into miracles. Verse 6, this passage gives me the chills. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. Peter was like, Jesus, you came back for me. The other disciples followed to the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, and there were fish on it and some bread. A fire of burning coals. Do you know that is only mentioned two times in the Bible? It's mentioned right here, a fire of burning coals, and the other time was, that's what everybody's warming themselves with as they stood around and said, you know that, you're with that guy, Peter. Jesus took him back to the very feeling of that moment. He committed the worst sin of his life, denying that he knew Jesus, and he goes, I'm redeeming this moment right now. Peter, it's not over. I love you. Oh, now the failure is becoming a miracle. And you know, I don't have proof of this. My engineer brain kicks in, but I think the fish were swimming under the boat all night. I mean, how could they have jumped in the net so fast? He says, put your net down on the other side of the boat. I don't know how this worked. I mean, I think it's like finding Nemo or something. You know, the boat are on, fish are under the boat all night, and they're like, they're probably talking to Jesus. Fish talk to Jesus, and they're probably like, Jesus, can we jump into the net? No, it's not time yet. And they're following all around the lake. They're trying to find the fish, and the fish are like, do we have to stay under the boat? Can't we just get in the net? No, I'll tell you when. Finally, here's the thing. Your miracle is closer than you think. You say, God doesn't see me suffering. God doesn't see my plight. God doesn't know what I'm going through. Your miracle's right under the boat. Just shut up and wait and keep looking. And all of a sudden, Jesus will go, now, now's the time for the miracle. Jump in, fishies. (laughs) 
God has a miracle that's beyond your wildest expectations. Ephesians 3.20, it's one of my favorite verses. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Give the Lord a big hand. That's what he's got for you. Reminds me of this elderly lady. She was well known for her faith and her boldness to talk about Jesus. She'd stand on her front porch in the morning and she'd go, well, praise the Lord. Next door to her, of course, wouldn't you know it, lived an atheist. (laughs) The atheist would get so angry because she was always out there talking about the Lord. He would yell back at her, there ain't no Lord. Well, hard times set on the old lady. She was having trouble getting groceries. So she prayed to God to send her assistance. She's like, praise the Lord, God, I need food. I'm having a hard time. Lord, send me some assistance. The next morning, lady goes out on her porch. There's a box full of groceries. Oh, she went to just praise the Lord. She's like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. The neighbor jumps out from behind the bushes and he goes, ah, I told you there ain't no Lord. I bought them groceries. God didn't buy them. The lady started jumping up and down even more excited. She goes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He not only sent me the groceries, he had the devil pay for it. Praise the Lord. (laughs) How many agree God can use the least likely people to bring about your miracle? Last one, number six. Watch as Jesus uses your story. He'll use your story. John 21, verse 16. Oh, excuse me, verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Now, people have tried to figure out this fish thing, 153. Why did the Holy Spirit put 153 fish? Do we need to know how many fish? Is this math with Jesus? Some people are going, well, if you take the one and subtract the five and add the three and, you know, and all this stuff. Here's why. I think it's a, a simple. It's the details of your testimony. I bet for the rest of his life, Peter would go, there's 153 fish that day, and that net didn't break. Another part of the miracle. See, you have a story. You have details. People used to call it giving a testimony. They'd say, stand up and give a testimony. Every single one of you has a 153 story. I told you some of the details about my restoration today. What's yours? Or maybe your 153 story is still being written. Maybe you're sitting in your chair right now and you're desperately hoping this is real. Maybe you're watching online. You're going, is this real? Praying that Jesus can do the impossible? Let me look in your eyes right now. He can do it. He can do it. Jesus can do it. I am proof that Jesus can heal and restore and bless and keep you. Look at what Jesus said to Simon Peter before he had his failure, before all this happened, back in Luke 22. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You know what strengthens the people around you? Hearing how God brought you through, brought you through that terrible time, brought you through that challenge, that setback, and repaired the damage. So I don't know what brought you here today. Regardless of why you're watching online or you're here today, God wants to tell you this, I love you. Yes. I love you. And this is your day. This is your moment. 
chains are broken. I'm going to set you free. Jesus is here in this place right now. He's restoring you. He's melting your heart. It's okay. Don't panic. It's okay to let him melt your heart. And if you will turn to Jesus and just go, oh God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm humbling myself before you. He will forgive you. He'll put his robe of righteousness on you, his righteousness. He'll separate your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. And he will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, you know me. Mm. You know all my weaknesses. You know what I did last night. You know what I did at work. You know what I've been doing on my computer, my phone. And yet you still love me. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me and putting a robe of righteousness on me. Thank you for never giving up on me. Help me follow your dreams for my life. If you've never committed your life to Jesus, would you just take that step right now? It's so important. You say, Jesus, I don't know if I understand everything about this, but... I like what I've heard. <clears throat> I know one thing, I want to be forgiven. So as much as I know how, I now ask you, would you please come into my heart? Would you forgive me? And would you set me free? Help me spend the rest of my life learning more about it. And Father, we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Pastor Sean, come up here and clean up this mess. How many love your pastor? Give him a hand. Love it. So if you, if you decided to follow Jesus today, as we do every week, we would love the opportunity to get to know you and to get to connect with you. And so you can take that card that's in the seat back in front of you that says hello across the top. You can tear off the bottom part. Fill in whatever information you're okay with us having, you can put it in the black buckets when they come around in just a minute, or you can take it out to the Welcome Center. You can also scan that QR code on the seat back in front of you, or the QR code up on the screen. You know, I think what's interesting when we talk in the, the realm of restoration, which this whole series will be about, which, uh, you know, if I'm being honest, I was a little uncomfortable during your story, and I knew your story. And I think it's interesting how when people uh, tell us about the tragedies of their life, it is a natural inclination for us to feel uncomfortable by that. But I think what's beautiful is that God doesn't feel uncomfortable about it, that God takes us by the hand and that he leads us and that he guides us. I think what's interesting is that uh, nobody ever would have judged you f for walking away from Microsoft and giving up $4.8 million worth. I did the math, by the way. I'm sorry. To let you know how much it actually was, $4.8 million. That's $4,800,000. Nobody judged you when you walked away from that. And if you wanted to come back to Microsoft, there is a loss that is involved in that. You could come back to Microsoft and they might would hire you today, but you still wouldn't get those 16,000 shares back. You'd have to start again. But as the thing said, it's never too late to begin again. I think what's beautiful is in that story that I've read, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many times I've read that story with the burning coals and that I've never thought of that before, which is such a beautiful picture. But, but what really struck me while Pastor Lee was talking was this idea where Peter jumped out of the boat because when Jesus comes back for you and you're desperate, you can't wait to get back to the shore. And so we are that shore. If you made that decision today, we want to help you get from this point to where Jesus wants you to be, which is more like him. And so would you give us that opportunity to connect with you? I'm, I'm so excited about the opportunity to receive the Lord's tithes in your offering, which every one of you know that I love to talk about money, which is a new thing for me. In the last few years, I used to hate to talk about money because I used to feel like people would go, oh yeah, he's about to talk about 
money again. And now I go, yeah, cool, get over it because I just, I just want to help you. I want to help you receive all of the blessings that God has for you. I got this old book. It's called God's Law First Thing. It's by a guy named Dr. Mike Hayes who pastors an amazing church in Texas. And I, I, just, re, I just reread this book this week and he tells this story. He says, I find it interesting that one of the biggest investment opportunities in the United States is in temporary storage facilities. <laughs> How many of you have a garage you can't park in because you have too much stuff? You may have noticed that they're springing up everywhere. We have so much stuff that we need to rent warehouses to store it for us. I hope to see the day when the body of Christ will resign from the quest for excess and begin to pass our extra provision on to those who need it. But Jesus said our lives don't consist in the abundance of stuff that we have. He described a rich man who found himself in the same dilemma in which many of us are finding ourselves today in Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. It says he possessed so much stuff that his barns wouldn't hold it all. Hello? His decision was to tear his barns down and build bigger barns. Too bad for him he didn't have a cause or a purpose to his life that was higher than the storage of his stuff. You know, the beautiful thing when you connect in the kingdom of God is that you suddenly have a cause that is much bigger than building barns for the storage of your stuff. Like last week when we gave to Pastor Lonnie, who we're still waiting to hear what the insurance is going to do. And then we're going to fill the gap. This week we got to sponsor an autism walk. We got to give money to people in the Ukraine. And your money gets to go and it gets to multiply. It gets to do things that you don't hear about or that you don't see about. But get this, when you give your money, you don't have to hear about where it goes to be blessed by where it goes. And so for all of us who are givers and we're tithers and we're people who want to sow and invest into the kingdom, we live our lives in a blessing that is bigger than ourselves because we've sacrificed. And so today, we're going to give you the opportunity to give and we'll continue to bring you different tidbits like like we just did today about where your money is going and how uh, other people are being blessed by your blessings. And so God, today we thank you for the abundance with which you've allowed us to live our lives in. God, so many of us here, God, we woke up in homes today. We, we weren't at war today. We, many of us didn't have a diagnosis. Some of us were healed from a diagnosis. And so today we thank you pray that you'd multiply all of the gifts that are given today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you watch the screens as you give? The enemy has tried to separate you, take you away from what you were created for, relationship. He's tried to tell you that you are alone through lockdowns, quarantines, fear, disengagement. You felt silenced, disappointed, confused, and alone. But none of that was ever from God. The truth, you are seen. You are perfectly known. You are loved and you are more than a conqueror. God needs women to rise right now to stand against the attacks of the enemy and to remember our place in his kingdom, powerful. Girls Retreat is a chance to arm ourselves in truth. There is strength and dignity in Jesus. Join us for what will be an unforgettable weekend. So today is your last chance, ladies, to register for Girls Retreat. We're closing registration tonight at midnight, and we have to do that because we have to get in some orders for food. So if you are waiting, uh, this is your final reminder. So go onto our website, lifechurchgreenbay.com. You'll find all of the information uh, to register. We would really love if you guys um, would come and just represent Life Church out in our city. We're so excited about that. Um, also coming up is Easter. So we have placed cards on your seat. There's two uh, every other seat. So grab two. Um, and what these are, they say Resurrection Sunday on it because that's what it is. And it's on April 17th. Um, we'll have service 9 a.m. and 1045. But this card says you're invited. Come sit with me. And the hope is that you give this to uh, someone who needs it, like, like your coworker or your neighbor or uh, maybe your family, right? Maybe they need that reminder and that invite. And on the back, there's a QR code that just takes you to our website 
so that if they've never been here before, maybe they can learn. Oh, cool, you have kids ministry, good to know. Um, and so we would love if you would just pack this place out for Easter. We're so, so excited about it. Also coming up is uh, Faith and Family Night at the Blizzards game. So this is something kind of fun and different and new this year. Uh, Pastor Dallas helped put us put this together, but we're going to have a section there uh, that's just for Life Church. So we're kind of like, it's a little community spot for us. Um, all the, pro well, $10 of the $15 ticket sale goes to Young Life, which is a mission that we support that's part um, of where your tithes and offerings go. And so we're super excited to be able to give them this gift as well. So be sure to register for that. That's on our website. And the date for that, um, I think it's up on the screen, when, uh, April 24th at three. So, all right, guys, that wraps up everything we have for you today. So we love you so much. See you next Sunday.